a sort of a almost natural consequence. Ethnomusicologists don't use this this term very often, natural. <laughs> and uh, and so I started uh, uh, performing uh, professionally at eight years of age. So very early in my life, I started to perform on television and so on in ch ch uh, ch uh, children's shows and stuff like that. And uh, uh, by uh, 1967 to 68 and, and so on, I, I started my formal training in um, music. And then I started to perform regularly and so on. And in parallel to this uh, performance uh, activity, I, I also became involved in politics. We had uh, a military dictatorship, actually a civil military dictatorship in Brazil at the time. And I, I became involved in political activism. Uh, 15, 16 years of age. So I had already eight to nine years of performing activities. <laughs> and that sort of gave me uh, uh, sort of a sense that music was always implicated in the political movements of, of Brazil in one way or another, in, both in pro protest songs and so on, and also immobilizing the oppressed sectors of Brazilian society. And music had a, a huge role, let's say, in getting uh, these people together and so on to think about their problems, to share their concerns with uh, the pathways that the country was taking. And so I always uh, was, looking for a field within music, a subfield or whatever, that might conciliate these two great interests of mine, both in music itself and in politics, in social life in general. And so um, I sought for uh, a, a music program at the university when I finally entered the university. This is a long story, but to, to make it short, when I fi finally got into an university, good one, by the way, here in Rio de Janeiro, um, I immediately saw that, I mean, the formal training in music was highly colonized, you know, sort of uh, highly uh, determined by European standards, 19th century European standards, uh, 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 to, to be more precise. And, uh, and that sort of uh, didn't interest me much, you know. I had already studied because of many circumstances and so on, composition with one of our most outstanding uh, uh, concert hall music composers, Guerra Peixe. And Guerra Peixe uh, did uh, field work on Brazilian traditions uh, from the Northeast of Brazil in the 1950s. He had published extensively in several sources, academic sources, daily newspapers, and so on, on his research. And that sort of motivated me uh, a little bit more to stay in music and to look, you know, the proper path within music to, to look for this conciliation between my interest in, my simultaneous uh, interest in, in music and politics. And that came with ethnomusicology, you know. So another particularity of the Brazilian academia, uh, by the, the end of the 1970s and uh, early 1980s, uh, to have a, a, an undergraduate degree in Brazil was an equivalent to a doctoral degree nowadays, you know. 
And so I started teaching at, at a university by the beginning of the 1980s without even having a master's degree. So uh, in 1985, I finally saw uh, an opportunity in a Fulbright scholarship announced that in, my, in the university I, I was working in, the Federal University of Paraíba in the Northeast of Brazil, uh, offering an opportunity for uh, faculty members, my case, they didn't have a, even a master's degree to pursue a master's degree abroad in the United States. You know, I applied for a, scholar, a master's degree scholarship in ethnomusicology in the United States. I, I started my studies by the mid 19, by uh, uh, July of, of 1985, I moved to uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And there I pursued my master's degree that I finished in 1987. And then I, I decided to stay there and complete my PhD, which I did in 1992. I think that gave me a good, a very good, I should say, a very solid perspective on how this, uh, let's say, both German uh, and Anglo uh, uh, traditions in ethnomusicology had worked until, let's say, the beginnings of the 1990s, right? Uh, the, the ethnomusicology program there gave to uh, uh, to the students that perspective, that solid perspective of developed developments since the beginnings of ethnomusicology by the end of the 19th century until what was going on by the early 1990s, going through several uh, tendencies and so on, intellectual trends. And that was very nice. I mean, in the sense that uh, that was not, uh, let's say, uh, very much known uh, in Brazil uh, and in Latin America as a whole. So uh, I had these perspectives about uh, what was going on in Brazil through my early uh, interactions with Guerra Peixe, this teacher of mine that I already mentioned and other colleagues at the university and so on. And to me, it, it was very interesting and very important to know, I mean, the dominant narratives, so to speak, about the field of ethnomusicology and to start thinking over also counter narratives <laughs> about the field of ethnomusicology, which is something that uh, I invested a lot uh, since I came back and started working at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where I teach until today. And so we developed new ways of thinking about the field and so on, incorporating uh, dialogical pedagogy into the ethnomusicology, uh, pers uh, self-critical perspectives on music and politics and so on, based on Latin American experiences. And that's more or less what we've been trying to do. I mean, being aware of the dominant narratives and so on, but trying to build, to build, I'm sorry, uh, counter narratives, which, you know, don't uh, disconsider, so to speak, uh, the dominant narratives, but confront them, you know, with knowledge generated from other areas as well. I, I took interest in radical pedagogy or dialogical pedagogy, uh, more properly saying, uh, through my activist work uh, before entering the university, right? So I had already an experience, for instance, with Paulo Freire, dialogical pedagogy. I had read that, I mean, I began reading Paulo Freire with 16, 17 years of age, 
you know, it was not you know, part of a formal training in an university or anything like that because he's, he was exiled at the time. You know, the military had, you know, made, made uh, him uh, to go abroad and to live there for quite some time. And the university didn't teach that because the universities, of course, had to deal with censorship and so on and so forth. It was dangerous to talk about uh, dialogical pedagogy in those days. So that had to be done, I mean, in community work and so on, political work outside the university. So I remember a, a quite illustrative, illustrative uh, uh, passage in Illinois uh, at a certain point, I was already in my PhD uh, stage uh, in Illinois, and Paulo Freire uh, came to visit the University of Illinois, right? I was in a seminar with Bruno Neto, Bruno Neto seminar <laughs> at that point, and I, I raised my hand and said, uh, uh, Bruno, uh, and to the class, of course, Paulo Freire will be speaking at the University of Illinois this week, you know? And he asked, he was that man who knew everything and so on. It was amazing, his encyclopedic knowledge of anthropology, several related fields and so on, about musicology. And, uh, and he said, Paulo who? <laughs> I mean, he, he, he came to watch Paulo Freire at the main auditorium of the University of Illinois but he was quite surprised because this auditorium uh, 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 could uh, make room for 800 people and so on. And the, the, the auditorium was packed, you know, packed to see a man who spoke uh, English, but on a very slow pace and so on, he had to think, you know, each word about each word. He, he, each sentence he, he wanted to, to, to form and to say and so on. And this 100 uh, people audience in silence, you know, wait, waiting patiently to hear what this incredible person had to say. And that impressed very much uh, uh, Bruno. So he started asking me to for references and, and, and stuff like that. It was a very telling moment of a great scholar like, like him. Actually, two great scholars <laughs> having this, you know, unexpected encounter. And to me, that was quite rewarding to be a, sort of a, a mediator of this encounter, you know. Excellent. But that, uh, and as soon as, as I came back, I started to uh, to find ways to find out uh, ways of integrating what I had. I mean, learn it from reading Paulo Freire and so on uh, to in, in my work in my ethnomusicological work here in Brazil. And I found out also, Kurt, that that is very interesting that many people in ethnomusicology had tried uh, before uh, my own in initiative, you know? And that was quite, uh, uh, this is a, a, an interesting point to raise in a series like that, because Australians had used Paulo Freire in the 1970s, since mm -hmm. the 1970s, and they wrote in English the output of their research, but this didn't make, what, this wasn't part of training at the University of Illinois, an important uh, training space for ethnomusicologists at, at the time, mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And Australians were doing that since the 1970s, right? Uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, we depended to develop this, these projects with these references in uh, dialogical pedagogy and also in participatory action research, which is a quite convergent uh, perspective, um, very close to, to dialogical pedagogy. Uh, this 
the, the spare heads of both movements, Paulo Freire and Orlando Faust Bordo was doing, were doing similar things without knowing of each other, just mm -hmm. to see the, discon the disconnection that these military regimes of Latin America in the 70s and so on, 60s and 70s provoked. We, we didn't know of you know, other uh, initiatives in other parts of Latin America. And, uh, and so the first ones were uh, somehow tied to the election here in Brazil of Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva as president in 2003. Mm -hmm. And so the research system, the research financing system uh, here in Brazil started to have the public interest as sort of a, a criterion to uh, prioritize the financing of research projects. And so we started with one called uh, Music and, uh, and Citizenship at Maré, which is the second largest favela here in Rio de Janeiro. It, it is the home to 150,000 people. It's like a, a micro city within a city, you know. And uh, we started working uh, uh, with a local uh, institution, you know, created by the residents to, I mean, uh, to put, move forward their uh, claims for citizenship and so on and so forth. And we started conversation with, with this with one organization, very visible organization, with a very good record of solid work in that direction. Uh, and we started uh, like a, a three month conversation, a long conversation on how to put together a project which would be of common interest to this organization and also to our uh, research unit the Ethnomusicology Laboratory, as we call it, right? And so from there, it developed a first project and then a succession of other projects within this community alone. Uh, and we've been there since then, since 2004. You know? And so we have researched uh, uh, a huge number of topics, for instance, the participation of women in music, uh, how the community goes about producing different kinds of events. Uh, you, you, you cannot imagine the diversity of events that happen in different styles and so on, even symphony orchestras. And, and the, you know, there is a huge program there and so on. So this counters all the, the stereotyping of favelas as having just one style that characterizes gangster rap and so on. Yes, it has that, but it has also a symphony orchestra, heavy metal, several, you know, cover bands in rock and roll and so on. It's amazing the diversity of styles, genres, and issues that you can uh, study within a single community in Rio. So, uh, what binds together the work of the Ethnomusicology la Laboratory is this idea of sort of producing some sort of impact, local impact of our research, uh, which can be seen as positive by the communities we work with, you know? But the, uh, the empirical work ranges uh, considerably, you know, from style to style, region to region, and so on and so forth. I, I usually answer this question in a plural form, <laughs> what ethnomusicologies <laughs> uh, may do uh, of good <laughs> to, to the world nowadays. And I think it is an extension of my, my previous ans answers. Uh, it's precisely to, uh, to have the consciousness that what we do in universities, in our research work, 
uh, will affect public life, will affect uh, social life in one way or another. Be it a book which will uh, stay, I mean, untouched on a shelf, on a university shelf, that has implications for the social world, right? So uh, when you write a research proposal and so on, you are conscious that this research will have some impact for good or for worse. So with you, in the conception of the, uh, the research proposal, you try to reflect very carefully about what these implications are about. So I guess uh, this nowadays widespread consciousness, uh, we have a lot to, to work on it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I believe this is something that is going on. It's reflected on uh, the recent moves within the Society of Ethnomusicology. We have some uh, reconfigurations of the society recently and so on, which are, I, I'm pretty sure of it, uh, related to this desire to move towards a more uh, effective consciousness of our social responsibilities with the world, you know, and in particular with the most uh, oppressed and underrepresented sectors of the world nowadays. 